I'm going to do a couple uh, seconds of introduction here. Um, I hope you guys are okay with me kind of being on the floor here instead of on this little platform. Uh, I tend to like the pace. So as people trickle in, um, just want to acknowledge a couple things. You know, being invited here for the 100th anniversary uh, is kind of an honor, right? Um, we don't get to experience things, I think, of that magnitude too often in professional life, at least. So I'd like to thank Dr. Cleveland for that. A couple of people that I'd like to acknowledge real quick um, is our spine management club on campus. If you guys could just raise your hands okay, up front, right, which is great. So the, the idea of what I'm going to share with you today is something that is essentially a professionally, uh, a profession long conversation. Uh, it's not a quick switch. Um, it's not a dimmer. It's a process that we go through as chiropractors to be part of the greater system, which ultimately helps us to help more people, right? So in terms of that, um, I'd also like to make sure that you guys understand that my 50 minutes is kind of the beginning of this, and it probably wasn't um, shown on the, um, the flyer very well, but we also have Dr. John Edwards here who's a neurosurgeon. Uh, he's down from Utah with Dr. Eric Lee, and he's going to be talking the next session about how neurosurgery views chiropractic. And I think there's going to be a lot of valuable insight. He's got some really nice slides that show you, you know, actually what it looks like to take a tumor out, what it looks like to take a disc, what, what um, you know, um, all these other conditions maybe that we refer out. So I think it'll be very, very important uh, to, to view that. So <clears throat> in terms of where we're at, what I wanted to do today was kind of help everybody to understand the thing that I struggled. I graduated 25 years ago. I was a national grad. Uh, I practice uh, in Buffalo. And about, what was it, two months ago, we had uh, Dr. Edwards host a conference in Utah. And he asked me to do an eight minute med talk on what the chiropractic adjustment is. Now, mind you, this group, we had maybe a dozen chiropractors. The other 350 were other healthcare professionals. And I think in our profession, there's always this sort of underlying struggle of being proficient at talking about what exactly the chiropractic adjustment does, right? From an evidence-based perspective, but in a way that other professionals can understand and then understand and see where our lane is as chiropractors, right? Because um, that's where we need to fit. So I thought today I would break that down a little bit, spread it out. Um, thankfully, it's longer than eight minutes today. Uh, that was a real challenge for me. Uh, it was probably the hardest that I ever had to like prepare for a talk. Uh, eight minutes goes by in a blink of an eye. So we're going to go through that, and then I'm going to talk to you guys just a little bit about how that conversation can really um, give your boost to your practice. Hey, Mark, good morning. Dr. Pfeffer. Um, and help you to be in a position where you're respected be in a position where your insight is, is valuable to the team. And the offshoot of that is the more that we collaborate, and, I, and the word really should be collaboration, not integration, right? We're not losing our identity in this process. We're actually enhancing it. And the more that we're around each other, people of different mindsets, people of different professions, the, uh, the more we learn, right? Because we're learning from them too and we're learning from their perspective. So, uh, just my background, um, I'm on postgraduate faculty at Cleveland. This is where we do our continuing ed across the country. And I'm also in the family medicine department on faculty at the University of Buffalo Family Medicine Department. My goal in the family medicine department is to bring this sort of biomechanical awareness to medics, for them to understand that the body is not just a series of chemical reactions, right? And that's the basis of pharma. But there's an entire process of mechanics and interaction in our body that's going on thousands of times a second. And the chiropractic philosophy, the chiropractic viewpoint is the profession that needs to be part of that. And we could probably sit and argue that a lot of the more apparent healthcare problems in our country, particularly with spine, are related to sort of ignoring that mechanical perspective. You know, we, we have friends that are mechanical engineers, and I have a better conversation sometimes with the engineers about spine care than we do family medicine docs, you know, because they have no education in it. And I don't think it's, it's proper for them to, to get that, just like I don't want to sit through, you know, an internal medicine curriculum either, right? So 
In 2016, I was the first chiropractor to go through the Royal College of Physicians training. And that training was, is basically a way for the med schools to teach clinicians how to be attendings. So let's say you're out in the field and you're a family medicine doctor and you're like, hey, I love practice, but I wanna kinda get back into the academics, just like your, um, your clinicians right here. Uh, there's a skill set that you need to be taught. Uh, it's not an innate behavior. Uh, having a student, a patient, a practice, all of those things um, are difficult. And this was a one-year program. It was the first chiropractor to go through it, but the only, obviously, in that room. So our group was about 45 um, professionals. Uh, interventional radiology, we had neurosurgeon. I actually had an uh, obstetric surgeon which was one of the most amazing uh, things. He has to be reboarded every year. And they actually do, like the surgeries are amazing. They actually can 3D print off an ultrasound and actually show the parent what they're gonna be doing. Um, so two emergency room psychiatrists and a neurologist. So I went through this year program with them. What came out of that program is we had a project at the end of that year on interprofessional communication. And it was that time that I was shocked, really, at how much support I got from those medical providers and encouraged me to kind of dig deeper into my chiropractic brain, the chiropractic profession, and how we can elevate it. And they offered as much help as probably anybody could. And what came out of this was our fellowship training. We have a two-year program uh, in this process. But my, my point is that if you can start, and I'm gonna help you to sort of start to look for this, if you can find those medical providers in your community that have an uh, academic kind of curiosity and you can explain yourself in a way that makes logical and evidentiary sort of um, sense, you're gonna get their attention, okay? The days are over. It wasn't until 1984 that the American Medical Association actually lifted its stance that it's unethical for allopaths to associate with chiropractors. That was 1984. So when you're looking for medical doctors in the community, keep that date in mind. Most of those doctors that have a significant bias um, are starting to retire. So the opportunity is, is amazing. So understanding validation. We're going through a very significant process right now in the validation of what chiropractic is and what our role is. And we have to consider all of the things that are included in validation patient satisfaction, good outcomes, supportive research in peer-reviewed, medically indexed journals, and not just ours, right? Dr. Edwards should be seeing discussions about chiropractic care in a neurosurgery journal. The obstetric doctors should be seeing it and chiropractic and pregnancy in their journal. It's critically important that we cross-publish. Um, community trust, understanding that, hey, is a doctor of chiropractic in the community gonna miss something? You know, is that really a, a headache due to a biomechanical problem, or is there a vascular issue that uh, we need to catch? Okay, there's a variety of those things. But diagnosis in that trust is everything. It's not, despite what we all think, it's not about our hands, it's not about our adjustment. What builds trust is our ability to make sure that we understand everything that's going on with that patient and we don't miss something. Missing one thing in a 50-year professional career uh, is a detriment. Right? So we want to make sure, and we'll talk about that. And then ease and consistency of communication. Knowing what you do, being able to describe it, and being able to be consistently talking about it when it's necessary is important. So all of our workflows, all of our EMR systems, all of those things should be a really stress-free process that allows us to communicate. Just like we've always done with our report of findings with patients, it's the same process when we're looking at other professionals. Now, these are the two most important numbers to me, right? So I've been out 25 years. In the next 25 years, this is the focus, okay? Because if we can change these numbers, we're validated and we're collaborating. We treat about 7% of the United States population right now as a profession. So what that means to me is there's 93% of the patients that are out in that community that are either in other offices, self-directing care, maybe not getting what they need. The future of chiropractic is in the 93%, okay? Uh, about 80% of my current practice right now is medical referral. And I would say 98, 
of our new patients that come into our practice don't know anything about chiropractic, they've never been to a chiropractor. And that was always our goal, that's our metric. Because if I have those patients coming in and referral, I'm pulling from that 93%, I'm not pulling from the seven. I'm not fighting over the seven with the doctor down the street. We're not convincing people because they're doctor shopping. Okay, so when you evaluate your practice, start looking at that, right? Look at your compliance and look at what people are doing and try to start to understand whether you're in the seven or the 93. My personal belief is through this validation process, through some of the topics that Dr. Edwards is gonna to talk to you about in the next session, um, we're probably on track in the next five to eight years to be at 30, 38% utilization, right? Which has its challenges. It's great for the profession, but could you see double the patients you're seeing right now with your systems? Could you see three times the patients? Okay, so sometimes being busier is not always a great thing if we're not prepared for it. So it's all part of the conversation and we're growing. Now, in terms of this as sort of evolution and understanding what we do, who are we communicating with? Okay, there should be a unified message that's coming out of your mouth, right? Coming out of my mouth. It doesn't matter if you guys were patients, if you guys were orthopedic surgeons, neurosurgeons, primary care surgeons, uh, researchers, lawyers, or the courts. It takes all of these groups to understand what we do. And we survived for all of this time. Cleveland University is here for 100 years because of patient satisfaction. We have always been heavy on the first line there, right? And now the validation process is requiring us to go a little bit deeper. But the cool thing is we don't have to say anything different to other professionals as we say to patients. So if you think about this, when you're out in your community, what is the one unifying intervention in healthcare? The one thing that that spine pain patient is gonna go to pain management physician, they're gonna go to their primary care doctor, they're gonna see their physical therapist or their acupuncturist or the chiropractic doctor, right? What is the one thing ultimately that we're really trying to do? We're trying to manage sensory input, okay? And this is where the discussion of the chiropractic adjustment and what our intervention does. You know, if a primary care doctor looked you right in the eye and say, what do you do, right? What are you gonna, what do you do to my patient, right? I would say and I would argue that there is a vast majority of us out there that would kind of get stuck on that. Right? We would say, oh, well, it depends, and we would go through this sort of litany of things. Okay? But managing sensory input is everything. And what we're all trying to do is look to the cause of that sensory dysfunction. Okay? Maybe it's pain, maybe it's functional loss, maybe it's um, issues with childbirth. There, there's a variety of things, right? But everything that typically we're doing when it comes to spine to start is that sensory dysfunction. Now, we understand that in this sensory dysfunction paradigm, it's really just a pathway, right? That's why um, engineers really understand what we're talking about because it's a functional living entity, right? So we have these afferent and efferent pathways. We have pathways exiting, we have pathways entering, but ultimately, it depends on spinal health. It depends on spinal joint motion, right? So if you think about it, if everybody in the community is looking to identify the cause of mismanaged sensory input, and the spine and joint motion plays a major role in regulating that, there is no other profession that is better suited to be part of a care team than a chiropractor. That's our main concern, right? So when it comes to our mindset, this is what we're looking for. Motion in the spine, segmentally and globally, right, manages and guides proprioceptive and mechanoreceptor function. You know, Dr. Lee and I had this conversation why he would adjust a gymnast before they get on the balance beam. Well, the gymnast doesn't have any pain. There's no injury. Um, so why would you even do that? Well, you would do it because proper joint motion enhances the neurological experience. He's managing sensory input in that athlete because they're flipping around on a two inch wide piece of wood, right? It makes sense. That's why we're providing that care, right? But the biggest thing to understand 
is that all of this spine stuff essentially provides a translatory uh, process from the outside environment to the central nervous system. That's the key, right? What's in between the outside world and our brain is that spine. And its health and its motion and its balance is critical, right? And without that, that spine sensory dysfunction has to be managed in a different way. And in medicine, that way is typically pharmacology or surgery. And now there's times, and I have plenty of patients that we collaborate on because their problem is complex enough where you need the team. But when they're mismanaged, that's when we start to get into issues where we can't back out of, okay? And we, we know what those issues are. So think about this, including the disc, the facet joints, and the pelvic joints. There's 76 joints in the human spine that are all part of this process, okay? And this is stuff that I talk to MDs about. So I just want you guys to understand that you can say this to a patient, you could say it to a neurologist, you could say it to a pediatrician. But all of those joints play various parts and roles. But the most important part of this is that without the ligamentous structure, none of this would be possible. The bones do not have the sensory cells in them, right? The ligaments do. And the ligaments are the ones that guide us. Think of somebody with a sprain, uh, sprain of their ankle. Think about how much dysfunction that is. Without a fracture, without degeneration of the joint, healthy cartilage, all of those things. Think about what a sprained ankle can do to the function of the human body. That's one joint, well, two joints really, right? If you take that and you apply that to the 76 joints in the spine, it starts to get interesting about what we would do about it, right? and what's going on with the motion and the balance. But they're all in this constant state of activation and deactivation. We're a moving, living entity. And it's all about this up and down regulation, right? Sensory coming in and going up to the brain, and then the brain pushing down to regulate it. Right? We already know that the, cor the human cortex filters out about 98% of sensory input, right? So how is this all managed? If you don't have a properly functioning interface, we're gonna have issues. Now, it could be proper, not functioning properly because of a fracture. Dr. Edwards is gonna show you some really great videos on pathology that is obviously surgical. But what about the day-to-day? -day? What about all of the other people? Okay, so this is occurring millions of times every second. But the interesting thing is that this system of 76 is really created around a known system. Right? When we were an embryo and when we developed and we grew, we all understand how the curvatures of the spine are developed. We understand why there may be uh, aberrant lateral curves, uh, curves like scoliosis and all these developmental problems. But the reason we know there's developmental problems is because we have a process, we have a map to compare it to. Right? We know what normal anatomy is. Right? So this entire neurological process is built around a structure, the spine, that's composed of 76 different joints, uh, and it's expecting it to work in a certain way. Well, you start to alter that, um, we start to see sensory dysfunction. And then how do we manage sensory dysfunction? Well, we can manage it medically, we can manage it biomechanically, or we can manage it surgically. But what's the most common reason that we're gonna have uh, dysfunction? Biomechanics, right? It's a process of aging, it's a process of response to injury, okay? But it's that known anatomical system that is, is, is important, okay? So it's predictable, it's adaptable, and it's dynamic. We can interact with it. That's why spine conditions are never cured, right? I, you know, we could sit up here and talk about that more, but the truth be told, most human conditions aren't cured. Maybe the only thing truly cured in the human body is pregnancy, right? So when we look at patients, that mindset, when you go into a medical office and you're talking about curative therapies, right, you're gonna have a disconnect because they know all they're doing is managing this living system throughout life. Now, we could stabilize patients, we could fix their pain, we can get them back to work. We might call that cure, but in the long run, there has to be a chiropractor tied to that human being that's monitoring this system. The amount of intervention, the cost of that intervention is gonna vary, right? But it's important that that biomechanical perspective is at the forefront, okay? So we have this biological, chemical, and mechanical system. 
It's super unique, right? Like think about cardiology. We talked about this on the way in there. Most systems in the human body, internal medicine wise, have a structural and a functional component. You have cardiac physiology, and then you have the structure cardiology, right? Every system, even GI, right? We can measure movement, and then we can also look on a CT scan to see if there's a structural problem. Why are we not doing that with spine? My answer to that is because our profession is just starting to wake up to take that role on. And I think that's why we go, we're going to get to the 30, 38% utilization, okay? But it's that system, that spinal system, that's the gatekeeper to the outside world. Even me standing here today, everything that I'm seeing and doing right now is being filtered through my brain and spinal cord, coming in and going out, right? And that's an important thing. So what it's required to do is reach a level of homeostasis with the surrounding environment, with each other, and with each joint, and the central nervous system. This is why we see spinal compensation. Okay? How many patients have you seen with a degenerative L5-S1 disc that was actually due to a biomechanical problem in the cervical spine? We see it all the time, right? It's the bottom part of this entire structure, right? So it's always adapting. So to say that it doesn't need to be monitored and it shouldn't be checked on occasion really doesn't make any logical sense, okay? Particularly from the mechanical side, right? So sometimes these interactions are a detriment, just like the compensation, right? We're looking for the cause, not necessarily where the pain is at. So it's important to understand that aberrant motion or aberrant feedback and aberrant flow in any of those mechanisms can really cause this negative cascade of events. If you have a, a, an infection, bless you, you have a chemical problem. If you have a disc herniation or a fracture or maybe a, comp a compensatory segment, you have a biomechanical problem, right? So all of these things play a role, and that's why the spine really can't be managed properly with just one professional. It takes a series. Some professionals are going to interact a little bit more, like us. Some professionals are going to interact a little bit less, like Dr. Edwards. Um, but who knows? Everybody's different, so having this team is important. But some of these structural problems and functional problems are symptomatic. Sometimes they're asymptomatic, sometimes they're chronic, sometimes they're not. Um, we look at the function, John looks at the structure, okay? It, it makes logical sense. So the regulation of all of this is based on a very simple premise. If the spine is moving properly, segmentally, and it's properly balanced, right, from atlas to sacrum, we're putting it in the best position to be that interface between the external environment and us, right? Pain management physician might prescribe an opioid to interact with the outside environment. We might look at the biomechanical process. Uh, Dr. Edwards might take the disc off the spinal cord. Um, there's a variety of ways, but making sure that we have the right treatment for the right dysfunction is important. Okay, and you guys all know that the vast majority of these problems are mechanical in nature. Okay, and the term mechanical um, is a great way to describe it to the medical community, and it's not downgrading what you do, but that's exactly the component that they're not trained to handle. Okay, and we talk about this in family medicine all the time. And there's no primary care doctor in my lifetime that I've ever talked to that wants to take that burden on. There's just no room. Right, and you know, one of my friends is the assistant dean for uh, medical education up at UB, and he said it perfectly once. And he said, "Bill," because I was like, "Hey, we should add this to the curriculum. We should do this." And he was like, "Bill, medical education does not have an anus. You can't keep feeding it because it's going to explode." Right, and it was kind of funny in passing, but it really made me think that it's the same with us. Like our education, your education right now as students is designed to get you to pass the boards and get you your piece of paper, right? We don't have room to keep adding to it. So we have to up level our CE and we have to have these kinds of discussions and how we become better at chiropractic because we're working with people that aren't chiropractors, right? And sharing what we know and being part of that care team. So this entire system operates better when these forces are equally and evenly distributed. Whether you were trained in an era where you call it chiropractic subluxation if you went through the motion palpation days like I did at National, we called it spinal fixation. You know, whatever it is, it's the same thing, right? But the unifying factor outside of all the language that we might use to describe it 
is managing sensory input. Okay? And it operates best when it's efficient. So movement is life because the brain is expecting a specific threshold, a specific level of expected sensory input. So we look at it globally, we look at it regionally, and look at it segmentally. Okay? So now that we understand a little bit about what we're really looking at when we uh, evaluate the patient, whether that's a sports patient, whether that's somebody that was in an auto crash, whether it's somebody that worked on the railroad that's just trying to get back to work to feed their kids, their interaction with their environment is our total focus. Right? So how do we influence it? How does a doctor of chiropractic, what is our role, and how do we play into this system? Where is our space? Where's our lane? Right? There's three ways that this system can be influenced. We can modulate it chemically, we can modulate it biomechanically, or we can modulate it through central nervous system stimulation. Now, although we could probably have a discussion about nutritionally how we could modulate chemically, um, for the purposes of this discussion, we would leave the chemical side to pharma, right? We would look at a pill, an injection, that can actually change the regional physiology of that inflammation and from a chemical perspective change it and influence the nervous system. But for chiropractic, the bottom two are where we're at. That's our lane. Okay? We can influence this structure with chiropractic adjustment. We can also move certain bones biomechanically to position them, right? to use a real basic description. Or we could just provide a high velocity, low amplitude adjustment that stimulates the nervous system. Sometimes we're not trying to balance anything biomechanically. We're just trying to interact with the central nervous system. The basis of this talk was my sister who has special needs, and when she was young, she would have a lot of like sort of subtle seizure activity. And it was an upper cervical HVLA that would stop that in a second, right? She'd get all hyperactive and her eyes would get all squirrely. It was almost like a, a random nystagmus. I mean, it wasn't even nystagmus, but you know, but as soon as she got adjusted, she'd sleep for about a half hour. So I wasn't trying to correct her biomechanically, right? But what we were doing is influencing sensory input. And we were doing it right basically at the brainstem, right? But that adjustment sometimes is not about a biomechanical correction. Sometimes it's about sensory input, right? So the chiropractic adjustment, and this is what we talk about. The chiropractic adjustment is a specific form of spinal manipulation looking to the primary source of spinal dysfunction, okay? So it's a category of spinal manipulation, right? That's been around for a very, very long time. But what makes chiropractic different is its specificity, right? This is what distinguishes us from any other profession that performs manipulation, okay? Our vitalistic founders called it intent. If your intention was on, your adjustment was better. We would probably call that nowadays diagnosis. Good set of x-rays, understanding the functional movements of the patient. This is, is this a primary problem? Is it a secondary? Is it compensatory? Is it pelvis? Is it occiput atlas? What's really going on, right? It's that diagnostic process that defines chiropractic. Our art is the adjustment, but our science is in finding where to do it. So, we do two very important things when it comes to the chiropractic adjustment. Okay? So when a medic or an MD would ask me, well, so what do you do? Well, we provide a very specific form of spinal manipulation that's based on biomechanical and central nervous system diagnosis. And we do two things with that. Number one is we create, restore, and maintain normal range of motion at the segmental level. Okay? That's not cervical spine flexion, it's C5, C6 flexion. C7, T1 rotation, right? All of those things that have been our historical listings are that component. That's the basic intervention um, that most people know about with chiropractic. And we diagnose that through a variety of ways, right? We diagnose in motion palpation, postural analysis, or especially in complex cases, x-ray analysis, okay? It's not, it's not proper, bless you, it's not proper, it's not logical, and it's not scientific to avoid the use of x-rays to diagnose patients that have significant biomechanical abnormality, right? Um, it's important because that's how we can help people, right? We also can provide direct sensory input through that adjustment like I talked about with my sister. So there's definitely people that come in for different reasons, right? Why do they feel better after? Well, maybe 
their pain's reduced, but maybe we, we just reset everything, right? So this is true in all phases of chiropractic care. And in spine care, we focus on three phases. And this would be a little bit more of updated language for you guys in terms of what we do and how we do it. Um, we look at our patients at a phase of care that's related to pain. And we know that a lot of the research supports uh, chiropractic adjustment modulating pain at the central nervous system, right? How many people with headaches that had central uh, stenosis in the cervical spine or vascular abnormalities that you did not touch because of underlying pathology, but adjusting in the thoracic spine and upper lumbar spine would provide enough sensory input for their headaches to feel better. Okay, we've seen that throughout our careers, right? So if we start to put it together, we understand that pain management, chiropractic can play a really, really important, significant role in there because it's handling the bottom two out of the three. It's not the chemical, but it's the biomechanical and the central nervous system component. The second phase of care is the corrective which is now we're starting to look at sagittal balance. Dr. Edwards will probably touch on that a little bit. In the surgical space, sagittal balance, pelvic incidence, all of those things are critically important. It's on the forefront of all of their discussions, right? We know all about that, but we don't always communicate it very well. That's our um, focus of the corrective care, balancing the spine from top to bottom and side to side, right? Because now we're past the pain phase. And then lastly is health maintenance. Now, some people call it wellness. Some people call it supportive care, and it goes back and forth. But if you read the research and they start to talk about it, um, health maintenance seems to be more of the word that's coming up with the really sort of deep, well-done research. So this is the paradigm. How long it takes a patient to get from one phase to another, nobody knows. Because if you're practicing in an evidence-based, patient-centered way, the only way to know which phase you're going to is to re-examine the patient. You don't know, right? We look at a patient in a three to four week span, and then we relook at them again. How long they're gonna be, we don't, we don't know. It's just based on the evidence. But these are the phases. So when you talk to the medical community, when I've testified in court, when I'm talking to a jury or a judge, this is the process that we go through with the patient. The chiropractic adjustment is part of that because it handles two thirds of the interventions in spine problems, right? And we can do, that intervention is good in all of these phases. And the chiropractor can be part of that, right? But that's the important word. The chiropractor is part of that. And because we have such an influence on so much of this care path, it makes sense that the chiropractor is the person that's watching over the patient. If I refer a patient that, say, has a uh, non-responsive disc herniation and some lumbar radi uh, radiculopathy, and I refer them to the interventional pain doc to take a look and maybe they, maybe they need a facet block or an epidural. That patient is gonna call that pain doc, say on January, have an initial visit and be scheduled for February for an injection. And maybe they do a second. So let's just say they go to the second, right? That pain management doctor has seen that patient three times, typically once in a long-term detailed interview and physical exam, that's it. Now, if that patient is acute and they're in my practice, we're seeing them three times a week for four weeks in January, three times a week for four weeks in February. That's 12 visits. So my interaction with that patient is 12 times longer than that pain management physician. And you know what we're good at? We're good at putting our hands on people and talking with them and guiding. And that pain management physician is good at identifying exactly where that injection should go with our help. Because without the biomechanical side, that pain management doctor is kind of half blind. Right? We're not just going off the MRI, we're looking at the function of the spine. And having the chiropractor as part of that team is critically important. And we have a much better chance of guiding that patient, helping them to understand what's going on uh, than any other provider. But it makes sense that we would all know what that pain management doctor is gonna do, at least from a, a global perspective. Okay, Sue, this is what's gonna happen. You're gonna go in there, they're gonna examine you, and they're gonna talk about this process. This is what it is, this is typically what they do, this is why they would do it, and this is kind of what the expected outcome. I'm gonna let him give you, the, or her give you the details, but I just want you to understand that this is part of your care plan. So if I understand what Dr. Edwards is doing, if I understand what the pain management doctors are doing, and I understand these people, I can apply my craft a lot better because I'm able to really, truly care for that patient. I'm not adjusting and releasing, adjusting and releasing, right? 
So what does the future really hold for this? Um, we've had this discussion. You know, we started the fellowship program in 2016, and I've been on faculty at that med school since 2012, right? The future is really waiting for us. No other profession is going to make the space or create the curriculum or announce the process um, of what chiropractic, what role we can fill, right? What it's really doing is just waiting. And while we're waiting, patients are being put on narcotics, patients are being pushed on surgical routes, the emergency rooms are overloaded. It's a perfect time for this discussion about what a chiropractic adjustment really does and how a chiropractor that's tuned in to all the other providers in their community can play a real central role in how that patient is managed and cared for. So without that chiropractic adjustment, and I'm gonna steal something from Dr. Edwards, um, without the chiropractic adjustment, you lose the, the ability to manage a spine case interprofessionally. The chiropractic adjustment, as I had mentioned, covers two thirds of the interventions in spine, okay, outside of surgery. So if you're not trained in that process, in that treatment, well, you can talk about what's wrong with the patient all day, but if there's no intervention, guess what? We're back to where we started. That's why you cannot use a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant in this, in this role. It has to be a chiropractor that understands the role of everybody else in the community. Dr. Lee uses this great analogy about a conductor of an orchestra, right? You have to understand how the violin plays and the cello and the flute section and all that. You might not be super proficient in it, but you're the one that's coordinating all of it. So if you went up as a conductor and you had no idea what a flute or a cello was, your orchestra is gonna sound like crap, right? So it makes sense when we're communicating interprofessionally, us understanding what everybody does is important. Just like you want the surgeon to understand what you do, the surgeon really is curious as well. And they wanna know what we do. The problem is, if we're not communicating that in a modern, evidence-based, patient-centered way, we're gonna be marginalized. So here's the key. Oop. Here's the key. Diagnosis over treatment all the time. We can sit in this room and we could talk about the vector of thrust, we could talk about the listing, we could talk about upper cervical, we could talk Gonstead, we could talk F and D, we could do that. That's for our profession. That's how we get better at our craft. That's how we uh, learn from each other. But when you're out in the community, the power you have is in that biomechanical diagnosis because the adjustment is not successful without that biomechanical diagnosis. You looking at that x-ray, looking at the compensatory pattern, looking at that listing and providing a correction is the key to all of it. So when we explain ourselves, we always lead with diagnosis. I would say if there's 100 MDs that I talk with, probably maybe 10 or 15 ultimately really want to know what the actual intervention is, the adjustment. But if I call that pain management doctor and we say, hey, listen, you know, this is what's going on. Um, there's a, you know, a um, biomechanical abnormality. I don't think it's just um, functional. I think there's some ligament damage. It's probably the facet capsule after that accident. Could we just get a diagnostic block on there just to make sure because we're gonna go a different route, right? That is so much different than me saying, hey, I'm sending to you for a consult because I adjusted them and they didn't get better, right? We're doing the same thing, but we're intervening and, and discussing it in a, separate, uh, in a separate way. So the future is about the doctor of chiropractic being the center of managing these cases, but also being able to explain what we do in terms of the entire paradigm of spine care. For us, when we go down the rabbit hole of just describing what chiropractic does and we learn from each other, that's for conferences like this. But when you get a chance and you're up in front and it's reversed, right? And I'm the chiropractor speaking to medical providers, right? It's a different story because I'm playing one role in a much larger system. And the better I understand the languages and the, uh, the processes of all these people in the room, the better conductor I'm going to be. And ultimately there was a sneak peek 
but I love this slide, training, because without it, you look like a jackass, right? So be these people, right? Not this guy. This is critical. These are highly trained people, right? That's intimidating, right? But it's the process of your training. Learn from other people. Don't take basket weaving CE courses. Look at your practice. Look at how can I learn from somebody else in my community, right? One of our hallmarks is, is clinical rotations. If you're not in there with that interventional pain doc, watching them do an ablation or a facet injection, you're not gonna really viscerally understand what they do and you're not gonna be able to tell the patient this is what's gonna happen. I saw 50 of them. I know what's gonna happen to you and I'm sending you to this provider because I would go to them. But this is why we're doing it. Because that intervention is exactly it. It's an intervention. And then when that pain doc or the surgeon is done, they're coming back to you. Okay, it's just a pause in the care paradigm. Okay? So think about training, think about diagnosis, Thank you very much, it was a pleasure meeting you. I'll be around if you wanna talk. Um, if you wanna get in touch with me, just take out your iPhone um, or whatever that Google device you may have in your pocket is and uh, take that screenshot. I would be more than happy to chat, text with you, but thank you again, thank you very much.